Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about this. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Thank you so much. So today we are continuing in Mark's Gospel, and we are looking at a pretty crucial turning point in this Gospel. We are looking at the moment when Jesus' true character, his role as Messiah, becomes evident to Peter and the disciples in verse 27 through 30. You see, the reader knows that Jesus is the Christ at this point. If you know anything about literary devices, you will know that we experience dramatic irony when reading the Gospels. Dramatic irony is just a fancy way of saying we know something yet to be revealed to the characters in the story. Even though this is a true story and not a work of fiction, we understand something from the start of Mark's gospel that the disciples do not. So we have dramatic irony. In verse 1 of Mark, the very start of this book, it says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It opens with this, so we are starting out understanding that this story that we are about to read is the story of the Son of God, of Jesus of Nazareth, of Jesus the Messiah. That is very clear to us from the beginning, but not to the disciples. Until Mark 8 verse 29, Jesus spoke in vague terms about who he is rather than explicitly declaring himself as the Christ, as the Messiah. If you read through Mark up until this point, you will see that Jesus says phrases such as, the kingdom of God is at hand, follow me, the son of man, and he refers to prophecies and to the mission of the Messiah, but he has not yet said at this point that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. You see, at this point, he is a prophet in everyone's eyes. Granted, a prophet who is performing some pretty impressive miracles, but a prophet still in their eyes. When Peter declares, you are the Christ, in verse 29, it is just four words that he says, but it is this powerful revelation that he has, this clear understanding and conclusion. This whole time they have been spending with Jesus, following him, listening to his teachings, watching his miracles, and experiencing his presence, they are speculating that this man is anything but ordinary, and that even though he is a prophet, that he is so much more than any other prophet that they have known up until this point. They know this as they're following him and seeing what he's doing. Peter's revelation of Jesus as the Christ is also a way of understanding that Peter has been paying attention. He has been paying attention to every healing, every provision, every cast out demon, every unusual lesson and parable, and every interaction he has had with Jesus. It is a declaration and confirmation that whatever Peter has been thinking about when it comes to Jesus up until this point has landed on, yes, this is the Messiah that we have all been hoping and praying for and that this is not just an ordinary prophet. The timing of this declaration in Mark's gospel 
is strategic because Peter's new clear understanding of who the Messiah is sets up Jesus' next lesson for the disciples. Jesus begins to tell them that the Christ, who they now know is Jesus, is destined to suffer, be rejected, be killed, and to rise again. So now we discover that our Messiah, who we have been praying for since the prophet Isaiah, is right here with us in the flesh, and then he tells us he's going to be persecuted. I want us to pause for just a moment and think on that. Think about what the disciples must have been feeling. Probably hope, maybe excitement, some joy, peace, and clarity. But now it's swirling with confusion, disappointment, maybe some anger or sadness, denial, grief. We just learned that this is our Messiah, our Savior, yet now we are being told he's going to be killed. Now, I think we could be irritated with them for not being hopeful about the resurrection part, but at this point in time, we once again have dramatic irony as readers, because if we have grown up in the church, or we have been Christians for a couple years, or maybe even just a couple of months, then we know what the resurrection means. We know that he's going to die, but we know that he is going to rise again, and we understand what that means. We know it's hopefulness, it's power, it's light, it's joy. The disciples in this chapter, however, do not know of any of this, because it says that Jesus just announces his suffering, rejection, murder, and resurrection plainly. He doesn't elaborate on it. So in their minds, all they have heard and understood is that this is the Christ. We have found our Savior, and now he is telling us that he's going to be persecuted. Peter's response to the swirling of emotions in his heart is to deny what Jesus has said. Denial. Has anyone ever heard of the five stages of grief before? Yeah? The five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And if you read through the Gospels and Acts and Romans, I think you will find that the disciples are a great example of those five stages of grief and what life looks like to go through them. The disciples are human. They are emotional beings just like us. So Peter's emotional response to this whirlwind of information that he has just learned is to rebuke Jesus, to be in denial of the truth that Jesus is telling him. Again, here's our dramatic irony if we have already read the Gospels before Mark, because we know this is foreshadowing Peter's future denial of Jesus. We will see this later in Mark, in chapter 14 verses 29 through 31, where it says, Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Then if we jump a bit ahead in the same chapter, in the same day, chapter 14 to verses 66 through 72, we see Peter deny Jesus three times and the rooster crow twice. Mark 8, verse 32 shows us that Peter really struggles with the idea of persecution. And this sets us up to understand that he's going to continue to struggle with this throughout the Gospels. Both the persecution of Jesus and the persecution of those who follow Jesus is a continual struggle for Peter throughout the Gospels. So Peter's rebuke of Jesus for telling his death and resurrection is the perfect opportunity for Jesus to teach on what man values or even what man fears or wrestles with in Peter's case versus what God values and how that affects discipleship. Jesus starts this lesson by saying, get behind me, Satan, For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The phrasing of get behind me, Satan, is quite extreme. 
because Jesus is setting up this lesson by pointing out how passionately he feels about this, about not focusing on the things of man, but by setting your sights on God's values. He tells the disciples, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. He tells them a paradoxical statement of, if you want to save your life, you have to lose it. Again, it is important to note that at this point in Mark's gospel, the disciples do not understand resurrection. They haven't seen it yet. They do not understand the value of it or the importance of it. So in their minds, they are probably thinking, how do I save my life by losing my life? But what Jesus is saying in this passage is that to be a disciple, to follow Jesus, is to humble yourself. He is saying that to follow Christ is to be like that of a servant or a sheep, and not to be like that of the master or the shepherd. And this is a recurring theme we see throughout the Bible, that God is the one ultimately in control. Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Mark 10, verse 35, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Galatians 5, verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Romans 8, verse 36, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. We are called to serve and to humble ourselves as sheep who need a shepherd, as people who are dependent on our Father in heaven, who is our ultimate provider and protector. We are not the ones working towards victory and glory, but rather we are the ones who serve victory and who serve glory, who serve the one who sits on the ultimate throne in heaven And this is what Jesus is trying to communicate to his disciples by foretelling his death and resurrection. Jesus is saying to lose your life both physically in the sense of giving your life for others as he does by dying on the cross for our sins and rising again for our eternity. But he is also saying to lose your life that you are living without him. He is saying that you must lose your life of human values. And what are human values? Human values are to prioritize your own safety, your own privilege, and your physical or emotional well-being and comfort over risking any of that to save others, to help others. Human values are when you have good intentions to help those around you, but when it comes to the day, to the hour, to the moment you are presented with an opportunity to choose yourself or another, you choose yourself. You choose to prioritize your own safety and comfort. In the Gospels, we see this over and over again. We see the disciples operating as an example of human values being played out. Whether it is Peter's denial, or James and John's pride, or Judas's betrayal, or Thomas's skepticism. But we also see how Jesus is the representation and the example and embodiment of God's values. He came to this earth to show us how to lay aside our human values, our values that prioritize me over you, and to lay them at the foot of the cross. Jesus shows us how to overcome our selfishness and our sin and to take up his God values. But what are God values? God values come from God's character, from his attributes that Jesus exemplifies on this earth. These values include humility, patience, kindness, and love, all of the typical things that are easy for us to remember to emulate, but sacrifice is also a God value. Sacrifice means putting others before ourselves and setting aside our pride our wants, our comforts, our privilege, and even our safety to take up humility and to care for the needs of others, to have compassion for them the way that Jesus does. Sacrifice means to take on discomfort 
and to risk being in harm's way for the sake of someone else. So now we understand that to sacrifice is to lose one's life, whether that be in the internal or external sense, but what about the rest of it? What is the point of sacrifice? Is this just sacrifice for no reason? Well, again, it says in verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What does Jesus mean by this? Lose your life to save it? We know to lose one's life is a sacrifice because Jesus set that example of the ultimate sacrifice for us. But what does it mean to save it? It means that you get to live a life of truth and a life with Christ. It means that you will start to experience a little slice of heaven here on earth. A life where you strive to work towards God values that lead to life and hope and a life where you dispose of the human values that will lead you to death and destruction. I believe that God has the ultimate dramatic irony. He knows the entire story. Your story, my story, the story of every person we see on the street, on the bus, on the tube, in Tesco. He knows every person's unique individual story from start to finish, which means he knows us. He knows our imperfections. He knows our struggles. He knows our pains. He knows our character. He knows that we are going to sin. He knows we are going to fall short. He knows that we're going to get lost. We're going to wander away from him. He knows we're going to make the wrong decisions. He knows that we will rebuke his truths that we're going to deny him, and that we will reject him. You see, Jesus knew Peter would deny him. And since Jesus is fully man and fully God, I have to believe that he knew Peter would deny him, even as Peter was declaring that he was the Messiah. Yet the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he still took up his cross, even though he knew Peter was going to deny him, even though he knew people would reject him and persecute him and hate him. He still died on that cross for them, for you and for us. You see, Peter was right. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. Jesus is our hope and our salvation. Even when we fail, even when we mess up, even when we place our human values over our God values. So here's what I leave you with today. A challenge. What human values are you holding on to? What are you prioritizing in your life? What are you holding near to your heart that God is saying to give it up and to give it to him? To stop holding it so close. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels." Jesus wants us to follow him. He desires a relationship with us, even though he knows our entire messy story from beginning to end and our sinful character. And he wants us to understand what it takes to follow him, to leave the old behind and to become new. But he also promises that a much greater reward is on the other side for that sacrifice a reward that is greater than anything we could ever ask for or imagine on this side of heaven. He knows that we will deny him. He knows we're going to reject him. He knows that we're going to turn away from him, but what he wants is for us to turn back to him. He knows. He knows the whole story, yet he still died on that cross for you and for me. Dearest Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this time that we get to spend every Sunday together 
and fellowship and community, but also this time that we get to have praising you, worshiping you, and learning about you and your great sacrifice that you made for us, Lord, to give us hope. I thank you for all of the things that you are to every single person in this room, as we sang earlier, God. I thank you for being our savior, our protector, our provider, our healer, our comforter, Lord. I thank you for all of the things that you do for us, Lord, when we don't deserve it. I thank you that you know our hearts, that you know what we will do, and that you know every wrong decision that we will make, yet you love us just the same, Lord. I pray that as we go about our weeks that we will be reminded to put your values over our values. I pray that whenever we see people, that we will not just see them in our human values, but that we will see them in your values, Lord, that we will see people the way you do, that we will have compassion on them, and that we will remember to put them before us, Lord. Thank you for the model that you set, Lord, the example you set of how to care for others, how to sacrifice your own wants and your own desires and your own comforts for others. Thank you that you go after the one and that you want us to do the same. And I thank you that we got this time together. I love you and I thank you so much. And I pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen.